Now we're turning our attention to animals we call vertebrates. This is going to be a subgroup of the chordates uh, and these animals actually do possess a backbone. Uh, in many cases, this is going to be a backbone made of bony tissue. In some of the vertebrates, the backbone is made of cartilaginous uh, tissues and we will see uh, those different types of vertebrates. One of the characteristics we can see in animals with a backbone is that they are going to have greater motility. And in order to move more in search of food and also avoid dangers like predators, these vertebrates need to have a greater development of the nervous system and also the presence of sensory structures like sensory organs. If you think, for example, back about the uh, urochordates or uh, tunicates, sea squirts, or if you look at the cephalochordates, like the lancelets, uh, there is a pretty much an absence of structures like uh, uh, photoreceptors, like eyes, or mechanoreceptors, like for the sense of hearing or detecting other vibrations that may be in the water. So with the development of sensory organs, now there's also a need for a nervous system that is going to allow for processing that information. And then that means that that investment has to be protected and what a better way to protect a more complex and developed nervous system than with the help of a skull, uh, like a case protecting the brain, and also vertebrae that would be protecting the dorsal uh, nerve cord. So that's the vertebrates. Those are the characteristics that you will see as synapomorphies, as a shared characteristics in this group of animals. There's vertebrae that are going to be enclosing uh, the spinal cord. There's going to be a more elaborate skull and uh, there's going to be also uh, better structures for locomotion and for sensing the environment. In, in the case of fish, that's going to be fins. In the case of tetrapods, that is going to be limbs like legs, arms, wings, and other structures we'll see in an upcoming presentation. So the most basal group of vertebrates is going to be the group we call the mixini or the hagfishes. They do have a cartilaginous skull. They do have an actual rod that is going to be providing protection to the dorsal nerve cord, uh, but they have pretty much rudimentary vertebrae. Uh, it's not going to be as developed as it is in what we call the bony fish, the osteichthys, or the land vertebrates. Uh, they have a small brain. Uh, they do have little primitive eyes and ears, and they have tooth-like formations that are going to help with the consumption of food. These hagfish are going to be all marine animals. They are going to be found usually living on the bottom of the ocean where they are going to be working as scavengers. When, when fish, uh, when other things that live in the ocean die, these are going to be there as the first line of uh, consuming the dead bodies of those kinds of organisms. Another type of uh, uh, basic vertebrate is going to be the lampreys. And here I need to make a little reference that I didn't mention before. Both the hagfishes and the lampreys don't have jaws. So these animals that lack jaws, in biology we call them as agnathans, meaning jawless. An agnathan is going to have a mouth that is going to be surrounded by sharp structures like teeth. Uh, take a look, for example, at this little a friendly smile. No, it doesn't look like a friendly smile. This here is going to be the mouth of a lamprey. And those are the sharp tooth-like structures that they can use for facilitating consumption of food. Uh, some lampreys are going to be parasites, meaning that they are going to be attaching to something else alive like a fish. And with these sharp tooth-like structures, once they attach to the side of the fish, uh, they will break the tissue to induce bleeding and then they, they feed on the blood and the fluids of another host. So these are going to have cartilaginous segments protecting uh, the dorsal nerve cord. Also, uh, they're going to be surrounding rem remnants of the notochord that still persist in the adult form of these animals. So about the uh, Mixini or hagfish and the Petromyzontidae or lampreys, one important detail that I want you to remember is that 
They don't have jaws, jaws that articulate and open and close. Just imagine like we have jaws made up of a mandible bone and a maxilla, the upper jaw, and we can open and close our mouth with the help of this articulation between those two main bones. These fish, uh, lampreys and hagfish, don't have that. In another uh, characteristic I want you to remember about these jawless fish is that there's only going to be a partial covering, partial protection of the dorsal nerve cord by means of uh, cartilaginous uh, plates, these structures that are not really completely surrounding protecting uh, the, um, the nerve cord. Now we get to another group of vertebrates we call the nathostomes. And so this part of the word here, natho means jaw, stomes means mouth. So these are going to be vertebrates that do have a mouth operated by jaws that can open and close. Uh, the hinges of those jaws are hypothesized to have developed from gill arches that form from the pharyngeal slits that you see during the development of the animal. Nathostomes are going to include uh, the sharks, which are cartilaginous fish, fish with a backbone made of cartilage, all the way through the bony fish, and then the tetrapods, uh, amphibians, reptiles, uh, birds, and mammals. And so what we notice here is that there's going to be greater development of a case protecting the brain, what we call the skull. There's going to be greater development of the entire central nervous system. And so vertebrae are going to be more sophisticated. And one of the explanations scientists provide for this greater development is the duplication of a family of genes that are known as Hox genes. So these Hox genes are, are basically like switches, a gene that activates another gene uh, and what happens with these Hox genes is that they are going to be regulating the formation of organs within body sections. And so for you, for example, if you think about the design of your head with eyes and ears, we don't have eyes and ears in any other part of the body. That is because Hox genes are going to be controlling the production of those organs and the nerves that connect to the brain for the functioning of those organs. That's Hox genes. They are genes that activate, regulate the expression of other genes. And when you look back at invertebrate chordates, uh, for example, the urochordates, uh, they had a one set of 13 Hox genes, one set, 13 genes. What you see in these animals called the, the nathostomes, uh, vertebrates with jaws, is that there's going to be two or more sets of these Hox genes. So that gene duplication is something that is explained to be one of the reasons there's going to be greater complexity in the development of the nervous system and the structures that provide protection for the nervous system. And then all of the other organs for locomotion and for living you can find in these more complex vertebrates. One of the things that you notice in addition to the enlarged forebrain of the nathostomes is that there is going to be, in the case of many uh, fish, the presence of this lateral line canal, which is going to allow for sensing water currents, give a sense of direction. Uh, obstacles that are in the water can be avoided uh, by the water that is entering through uh, little openings in the water, uh, in the lateral line canal. You can see where the water goes into these surface pores. And then they have specialized hair cells like the ones we have in our ear that are going to allow for sensing in what way, in what direction the water is moving. So any disturbance in the water can be sensed by this lateral line canal. One group of these uh, jaw fish, fish with jaws, nathosomes is the chondrichthys. And here we're going to see a variety of sharks, uh, rays, skates, uh, ratfish you see here in this picture. What these animals have in common is that the backbone is primarily composed of cartilage. There's going to be some, uh, a little more bone development when you look at the teeth in the jaws of these animals. Sharks are streamlined. They're going to have a very complex sensory system uh, of cells 
that can detect electrical fields. This is what you see right here uh, in, in zoology. These are known as the ampullae of Lorenzini and uh, sharks can use those uh, sensory uh, structures, sensing electrical uh, fields for navigation and also for finding prey. They have an acute sense of smell. They can sense uh, chemicals in water. Some say this is how sharks can be attracted to something that is bleeding by sensing blood in the water. They're going to have a complete digestive system and the con the, uh, digestive system at the end uh, near the exit is going to be merged with the exit to the reproductive system forming what we call a cloaca. So both excretory and digestive and reproductive systems are going to have this common uh, pocket called the cloaca. Osteichthys are going to be the fish with bones. Uh, they have a bony skeleton made of bony connective tissue. Bone connective tissue is characterized by the presence of cells called osteocytes, and these osteocytes secrete a matrix of uh, calcium uh, mineral that provides a harder structure for protection. Uh, here you're going to see most of the fish that you can find in the ocean. You can usually tell uh, bony fish by the presence of this gill covering, uh, which is called the operculum. When you look at sharks and, and trying to get to an image, maybe mm, none of the images really sh show that the, the sh sharks are going to have gill slits that are open to the outside. You can't see the gill arches in a fish because they will be pro protected by this bony structure called the operculum. Uh, so that's one of the characteristics of fish. Also fish are going to have more uh, types of paired fins. There's going to be pectoral fins. There's going to be pelvic fins, uh, dorsal fins, uh, and then um, those uh, fins are going to help with the movement, locomotion for these animals. So I mentioned before the protection of the gills by the operculum. They also have a swim bladder that can help the fish save energy by staying relatively in one uh, a particular depth in the water. So that is going to be the function of the swim bladder. It can collect gas and by regulating how much gas is present inside of the swim bladder. If there's less gas, the fish becomes less buoyant and can go down. If there's more gas, the fish become less buoyant uh, and is, I'm sorry, more buoyant and it's going to go up to the surface. And so this is how a fish can control buoyancy by regulating the amount of gas that is retained in the swim bladder. Sharks, uh, they don't have this, and this is a disadvantage for sharks because they have to be constantly in the move to go up or to go down, and this requires greater energy expenditure. They also have this lateral line canal we mentioned before, pores that lead to a canal with sensory hair cells for detecting disturbances in the water, and this is how fish can navigate more efficiently. Some fish are going to be uh, releasing uh, the eggs to be fertilized to the outside, and that's how they are going to be reproducing. Uh, other fish, after fertilization, they can collect the eggs and keep them in the mouth for brooding, uh, but the eggs have to be released first to be fertilized. Uh, there are going to be other groups of fish here, like the Aptenopterygii. These are going to be the ray-finned fishes. That's going to be your tuna, uh, bass, uh, salmon, all of those. Uh, fins, when you look at the rays in the fins, you will know that that's the type of uh, a bony fish you have. And then you have other types of fish here called the lobe fin fishes, the sar uh, sarcopterygii. And this is going to include animals like a coelacanth, a lung fishes. And uh, what these fish have is that there's going to be greater infolding inside of the swim bladder. And, and there's going to be a small amount of gas exchange that can be achieved there. And so the swim bladder is going to be like a primitive form of a lung that later develops uh, to a greater degree in animals like the tetrapods, uh, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds. That is the hypothesis for how lungs in tetrapods originates, have their origin in the swim bladder that functions like a lung 
in some of these low fin fishes. That's going to be all for the introduction to the uh, vertebrates. There's going to be another video that I will be posting for you explaining more about the diversity of the tetrapods. Uh, chordates with a backbone, uh, they have jaws and they live uh, completely or at least partially on land outside of the water.